Do we have, do you, are you aware of any sort of evidence of any sort of saw blades that can explain those cuts on those massive stones that Ben Van Kirkwick talks about? Like those massive circular saw cuts yeah. that are in those stones where it looks like they're using a fucking circular saw. Yeah, tube go, drill. Pfft. Yeah, yeah, tube drills. Yeah, so they've also taken chemical analysis from inside of these tube drills. Like these. Yeah, yeah, so you find these all over the Giza Plateau. The bottom left one, Steve. That's yep. a pretty good example. Yeah, so that's on the Giza Plateau. Mm -hmm. Those are saw blade cuts that are in the black basalt temple on the eastern floor of the Great Pyramid. And they found this, I've seen it in person up close where you can see the remnants of this bluish green material down inside of these saw really? cuts. Yeah. So it's, it's this arsenical copper or arsenical bronze with a mixture of the slurries. Now, what, so this slurry you're talking about is something that was used to make it more abrasive. So those saw, whatever saws they had could penetrate the stone far more easily. Correct. And we still use this in modern stone cutting applications right. where mm -hmm. you have the blade, mm -hmm. but you're also pouring an abrasive slurry during the cutting process, which facilitates the removal of the material. And mm -hmm. this is what we were talking about, how it's not necessarily the speed of the tool, but it's the feed rate that it was possibly a very slow moving slaw, saw, mm -hmm. but they were removing a lot of material with each cut of the blade, which is indicative that they were using a slurry compound to facilitate the cutting process. But what about the overcuts? Yes. Because there's over, it looks like, you know, when you're using a saw and you're cutting something and yeah. you go, you move too fast, you pull the saw up and then you correct yourself and yes. then you go straight again. So if they were going slow, yeah. how would you explain the overcuts? So I believe, you know, again, I, I do agree with the idea that there were machines. It's, it's not, you know, two guys right. with a saw that are moving this thing back and forth. Because right. if you had an error in the cutting process and it was just a hand operated two guys and a saw blade, if they messed up, you could stop very quickly yes. the cutting process. But if you're using a machine apparatus, um, you know, I could pull it up in the slides, but if you Google the Heropolis saw, mm -hmm. it's, it's a perfect example of a saw cutting machine that was being utilized by the ancient Romans and the Romans got everything they knew about cutting and moving stone from the dynastic Egyptians. Now, I don't think that mm -hmm. the Egyptian pyramids are part of the dynastic civilization. I believe that they came around before that in a period known as the Saharan wet period, which is about 8,500 BC to around 3,500 BC, just before the beginning of the dynastic civilization. Mm -hmm. So after the younger Dryas. Correct. Now, this is also a time period where the Sahara... This is the saw you were talking about? Correct, yeah. So basically, you have a water wheel powered saw that's connected to a series of gears. We were talking about gear ratios. Mm -hmm. So if you have a big gear and a small gear, the knowledge of gear ratio physics could very easily give you a very fast moving saw blade. And this was what was implemented by the Romans where they have this wooden configuration, right. these huge saw blade systems. Now imagine this being set up at your quarry site where you have a huge water wheel powered saw blade cutting system. Mm -hmm. And this is like, there's hundreds of these set up right. all over the quarry sites that are constantly just cutting stone, cutting stone, cutting stone. And they're, they're made of wood. And what do you think the saw is made out of? Metal saw blades. So, so by the time they were probably still using um, arsenical copper during the time, uh -huh. but then this also sort of moves into the iron age a bit later on. Okay, so they use these these giant saws with some sort of slurry chemical compound yep. that would help those things cut the stone, and they moved slow. But then how the hell do they get those fucking blocks up on top of that pyramid? How big are the blocks in the king's chamber? Those 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 pieces of granite? So the, the blocks of the upper portions, they call them the relieving chambers inside the Great Pyramid of Giza. Those are very, very large. But one thing about the construction of the Egyptian pyramids, so for example, at the top of the pyramid, mm -hmm. those are the smallest stones used in the construction. They put the mm. biggest stones down at the bottom, and every successive layer of the Egyptian pyramids, the stones get smaller and smaller the higher you go up. Right. But how big, so Stephen, look at, type in like the granite blocks inside the king's chamber. and Because the, there's like a- Oh, they're huge. There's levels of them, right? Correct. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I don't know the specific weight. I was going to say 65 tons. This thing here says 70 tons. But so yeah, those, 70 ton granite th blocks. those are incredibly large. There you go. Yeah. Click on that. Yep. Well, that's shitty. Maybe the next one. Maybe you can blow it up. So people, I want people to be able to see the, uh, yeah, zoom in on that thing. So there's like, why the hell would they do that? 
those massive 70 ton granite blocks with gaps in between them yep. with like a little TP roof on top. And that's pretty high up in the pyramid, right? The King's Chamber? Correct. Yeah. It's about in the center of the structure. So okay. it's not all the way at the top, but right. it is it is fairly high within the construction itself. Mm -hmm. And there is no good explanation. Um, I don't really focus too much on the construction aspect because it's one of those mysteries where, I mean, you could really right. speculate all day about how they did it. Um, there's a great researcher named Stephen Meyer mm -hmm. that proposes that the pyramids were built using water apparatuses and that mm -hmm. they were floated to the construction site using like wooden barges. And they recently published an article that that corroborates that idea mm -hmm. where they found a system of channels leading up to the Giza Plateau. Right. And you can use water enclosures and a system of water locks right. to move these stones up to the pyramid sites. And then let's say you establish your outer layer of casing stones first. Yes. You could then fill that area with water and use that to float the stones up to each other layer. So that's Stephen Meyer's idea. Huh. And uh, it's a very interesting idea because yep. I do believe that this civilization, they were masters of hydraulics and they would have used water to their advantage in basically every application, whether it be construction of the pyramids mm -hmm. or specifically regarding my research, water facilitates these chemical reactions, whether it's the mechanism of operation to push mm -hmm. the chemicals through the system, also used as chemical reactants. Water is used inside the Red red Pyramid. Mm -hmm. It's also used inside the Great Pyramid. Well, it's used inside all the pyramids, actually, in terms of the mechanism of operation that drives these things is right. water. What do you think the reason that those those granite blocks inside the King's Chamber, the, the bottoms of them are like perfectly flat, right? And yep. the tops are kind of like, un, like they're not perfect. They're yep. kind of rough. Yeah, so that's from the construction. So you see where the rough part is in the core and the flat part is laying on the level of stone below it. Mm -hmm. So they use that to make sure that it was level going all the way up with each level. You don't need the center piece because it was exposed to the inside of these relieving chambers. But on the edge of each one, they're flattened out. But in the center, they're completely rough. Right. So this was also a civilization that understood the mentality of work smarter and not harder. So you think that so the they, rough part, they would just, it didn't matter. It didn't matter, right? right. It was never going to be utilized. So I also believe that these structures are geometrically configured to amplify sound. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think it was. it's like F sharp that resonates through that, that whole pyramid, right? Correct. The Great Pyramid. Yeah. So like when you have the inside of a guitar or a violin, for example, mm -hmm. it's very important to precisely tune the inside of that device because that's what causes the sound amplification. Right. So the geometry of the inside of these chambers was very, very important. And the finishing of the inside, mm -hmm. for example, when we talk about the Serapium in Saqqara, you know, these huge containers inside the Serapium that mostly are not finished on the outside, but they were very, very intent about finishing the right. inside of these containers. Mm -hmm. So there was something about the acoustic properties of the inside of the container for amplification that wasn't necessary to finish the outside. So that's why the I do believe that the bottoms are flat was just to ensure that each level went up correctly, mm -hmm. but then the rest of it wasn't necessary to flatten everything out. 